you. Donna wrote that song. Donna writes lots of songs. Donna. I think Donna writes good songs too, don't you? I love this. You wrote, you let me live in your mercy. You dance with me at your throne. Bring me into your presence and call me your own. How great is your love. Man, it's good stuff. That is good stuff. I'm going to have her sign this for me and I'm going to keep that. Well, good morning, everybody. How many of you were here two weeks ago when I started on this uh, two-part series, the longest series I've ever done? <laughs> you know what? May, no, I can't say that because on a Wednesday night I've done three or four in a row. So, But you know what? This, this, is, uh, this is important stuff. For some of you, this, this, this may not be interesting at all. For some of you, it might stir you up and... Others of you, you're, you're like, wow, I didn't know any of this, you know, but it's good stuff. I want to I wanna recap from two weeks ago, just very quickly, and there's, you know, true to form, I bring a lot of material, you know, and, and so you're going you're gonna to have to just buckle up, take a deep breath, and just take it all in all at one time. If you want my notes, bob at realchurch.org, I'll send them to you, okay? If you, need a, if you need a replay, or you can, uh, you can get it later in the uh, resource center. Abraham. Abraham was given a covenant, a land covenant, and a promise of descendants and, and more. A covenant with God. Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac was the son of the promise. Ishmael was given a blessing by God, but he was not the receiver of this covenant promise. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob received the covenant promise. Esau did not. Esau is the father of the Edomites. You may have heard of the Edomites in the scriptures. And then Jacob's name is changed to Israel. He is the father of the twelve tribes of Israel. They go to Egypt where they have a great blessing and abundance over time. It becomes slavery years and years of slavery. They are brought out of slavery by Moses leading them. They go to the mountain. They receive the Ten Commandments. Joshua then leads the children of Israel into the promised land at that time called Canaan. Over time, the tribes are, are split. There's the ten tribes in the north. It's called Israel. Two tribes in the south. It's called Judah. And since that time, and despite the exiles and many occupations of the land by foreign rulers, there have always been those people, the Jews, living in the land. Around 135 A.D., the promised land, then called Judea, is changed to Palestine by Hadrian. And if you remember, I was talking about why was it changed to Palestine? It hasn't always been called Palestine. It was changed in 135 A.D., and, and that was to kind, to, uh, kind of, of make a stench in the nostrils of Israel, of the Jews, because the Palestine comes from the word plashet, and, and that is a, a word that, that means migrant. It it's really refers back to the Philistines. So in, in, a, in a very real way, the word Palestine is Philistine, okay? And, and that's where that is. So that's, that's how that name came in. From that time to the present, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Arabs, the Spanish Crusaders, the Mamluks, the Ottoman, and the British have ruled that land. In 1897, the first Zionist Congress was convened by Theodore Herzl, and I think we have that picture. And like I said a couple of weeks ago, I think the Morleys are a direct descendant of this guy. He looks just like David, in my opinion. I'm going to get a big picture and hang it in his office. I think that would be pretty sweet. The Zionist organization was founded in, in 1897. The Zionist organization, uh, an organization that is, that is going to care for the needs of the Jewish people around the world, but basically in, in, uh, in Europe. In 1917 was something called the Balfour Declaration, the British Foreign Minister Balfour pledges support for a settlement of a Jewish national home. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, I talked about Theodore Herzl. He, he said 50 years before Israel even became a nation, 
He said, I founded the, the Jewish nation here in this place. He had, it was, it was a, a vision that the Jews would have a homeland of their own. And the, the Balfour Declaration was a, a positive step toward that becoming a reality. Then in 1921, something called the British Mandate for Palestine by the League of Nations. And we have an image for that as well. Here was the British Mandate. You can see in the dark orange and the light orange together was the original plot of land that was to be given in the British Mandate that was to be divided between the Jews and the Arabs. And as time would go on, something called the White Papers, and White Papers in uh, British Parliament are the papers that, they, they were called the White Papers, there were uh, changes that were made to mandates. And so there could be a White Paper for anything, really, but there were White Papers that were specific to this British Mandate, which whittled away all that dark orange space right there. That now is obviously the country of Jordan. And the, uh, the little light orange place is the, uh, the, the, the boundaries of Israel as it is today. But what you don't see on there are the parts that are carved out for the Arabs. So the Arabs and the Jews were then going to share that, uh, that's, that smaller portion right there. In 1939 to 1945, World War II, the Holocaust, six million Jews are exterminated under Hitler. And I have a couple of images there. Uh, I, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of you probably seen just tons of pictures of the Holocaust and maybe you've even been to the Holocaust Museum. Uh, some of us who went to Israel in 2007 got to visit a place called Yad Vashem, which is the, uh, the Holocaust Museum that is in Israel. And it is very moving, very powerful. But a lot of images, and we've seen images of uh, Jews that, that are, I mean, they're, they're just skin and bones, literally. Or you've seen piles, and I mean, it is an incredible sight. Piles of bones and skeletons and, and the things that, that were done to the Jewish people. But I think this is one of the most hauntingest pictures I've seen with regard to this. In fact, in the, uh, in the Holocaust Museum in New York City, you pass through this, uh, through this little um, uh, pathway. And on either side, with plexiglass or glass windows as walls, it's just piled high on both sides with shoes just like this. And, and, and in fact, to walk through the whole thing, you have to walk through this part. And, and it is eerie to walk through this because this isn't just a pile of shoes. These shoes had human beings in them. The Jewish people were in them. And you can see the shoes of children in there as well, all exterminated under Hitler. And as you know that the Jews, as they walked around in that time, they wore a patch on their, on their uh, chest said Jude, the Yehudim, Jude, Judah, Jew. In 1947, there was a UN resolution in response to the atrocities that happened in World War II. The UN resolution was to establish a Jewish and Arab state in Palestine. The Jews, uh, as much as they did not like the terms of the offer and the amount of land that, that was going to be given, they, they, re they accepted it because they were going to at least be given a place that could be called their own. A place where Jews from all over the world, if you could imagine living in, a, in that time when, uh, when the Jews were being persecuted and exterminated, uh, that, what a cry that they had to have a place where they could go to, to be safe together. The Arabs didn't like it because they wanted the whole thing. They, they did not believe that the Jews should have that. And I'm talking in the simplest of of forums here because I'm telling you this whole situation and the history of it is far more complex than I can tell you in the next 30 minutes. It's something that you can research on your own no doubt but what happened was the UN resolved to partition that land in certain segments and it wasn't just half and half there were, there were segments of it that would be dedicated to the Arabs and the rest of it would be given to the Jews but the Arabs fully rejected that offer. The British mandate was about to expire on May 14, 1948. Up until that time, the Jewish people were, were staving off attacks. The Jews were coming in from all different lands, and they were building uh, what's called a kibbutz. And a kibbutz is a, a Jewish community where they, they held things in common. They would, have, they would farm together, and they were very successful 
uh, communities uh, called the kibbutzim. That was the uh, multiple kibbutz. And so those communities were very successful, but they were being attacked constantly by the Arab people around them. And so, you know, the, the Jews knew that they were, that they were in for trouble uh, when they declared on May 14, 1948. The Jews have been immigrating to the land called, and that, that's called an aliyah, where they'd be coming from all over the place. And I want to read for, uh, for you something from the book that I read from a couple of weeks ago called My Life by Golda Meir. In it, she says this, on, on the morning of the 14th of May, the 14th of May, 1948, the day that the declaration was made, she was in a meeting of the National Council at which we were to decide on the name of the state and the final formulation of the declaration. So they've come to this day, it's that morning, and later on in the afternoon, about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, David Ben-Gurion is about to give the address, but they still have not given the name of what is this place going to be called. Obviously, we all know it now as the state of Israel, but, but the world is watching and, and, and wondering, what are they going to call this? The uh, National Republic of Palestine? or you know, it, it, what, what is this going to be? So later on that day, they come together. And I'm going to find that. It says this. David Ben-Gurion... Uh, she said he, he cleared his throat, and after reading all of the, the previous uh, parts of the declaration, he comes to this. He says, Accordingly, we, the members of the National Council, representing the Jewish people in the land of Israel and the Zionist movement, the Jewish people being all of those who had been scattered, the land of Israel, he is not calling it Palestine right there, but he's calling it the land of Israel, what it historically was known as, and the Zionist movement. The Zionist movement is a political movement for the benefit of the Jewish people. They have assembled on the day of the termination of the British mandate for Palestine. This mandate was to terminate that day. And by virtue of our natural and historic right and the resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, do hereby proclaim the establishment of a Jewish state in the land of Israel, the state of Israel. And so that was the time the world found out that this was going to be called Israel. Not Palestine, not anything else, not Canaan. It was going to be called Israel. And just as a, a side note, they actually had a discussion of what, our, what, what, what are these people of the state of Israel going to be called? They decided that they were not going to be called Israelites. They decided they wanted to be called Israelis. And so if you ever wonder you know, why the difference there, there is actually a discussion and some, some, some learning that you can do on, on why they chose to be called Israelis instead of Israelites. So there it is. Uh, just, just the important events that had happened on that day. Uh, going on farther, he says, David Ben-Gurion says this, the state of Israel, and this is important for us to know, in, in, in the context of everything that's going on that you watch on the news, that you've been ingesting for years, because I would say 99.9% .9 of the people are not reading any history about Israel and where it came from. Everything that we have gotten, for the most part, we have gotten it handed to us by the media. So David Ben-Gurion, he says this, The state of Israel will be open to Jewish immigration and the ingathering of exiles. And, and Golda says that this was the very heart of the proclamation, the reason for the state and the point of it all. And she remembers sobbing out loud when I heard those words spoken in that hot, packed little hall. But David Ben-Gurion just wrapped his gavel again for order and went on reading. He said this, and pay attention. He said, even amidst the violent attacks launched against us for, the past, or for, for months past, we call upon the sons of the Arab people dwelling in Israel to keep the peace and to play their part in building the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship and due representation in all its institutions, provincial, or provisional and permanent. And we extend the hand of peace and good neighborliness to all the states around us and to their peoples. If you did not see on that map, it was all Arab nations surrounding Israel. 
and we call upon them to cooperate in mutual helpfulness with the independent Jewish nation in its land. The State of Israel is prepared to make its contribution in a concerted effort for the advancement of the entire Middle East. We, uh, and so I'm going to end there. What he's saying is, he is reaching out and, and he's saying, we can live together. In fact, if you were to read this and many other statements by, by Jewish leadership as this little nation is being, uh, being brought forth, being birthed, so to speak, the Jews were reaching out constantly and, and begging, literally begging, the, 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 Arab, the Arabs, I was going to, Arab Palestinians that were living in the land, but, but the Arab nations around them, begging them that we can do this, we can live at peace. But the entire thing was completely rejected by the Arab people living in Palestine and by the Arab nations that were surrounding it. Because they believed that on May 15th, the very next day, that they could go to war against this tiny farmer army Israel, defeat them, and take the whole works. That's not what happened. On May 15th, 1948, the very next day, those five Arab uh, states with their standing armies go to war against what is now declared the state of Israel. And that War of Independence goes until July of 1949. So for more than a year, they battled to, to hold that land. Now I want to I just give a, a quick little couple of statements, a synopsis of the state of mind of the Jews. Like I said, uh, they, were, they were calling for peace with their Arab neighbors and inhabitants. And, and there are numerous examples as we go forward in history of land for peace opportunities. And, and this is something I think also that reveals the heart of, of the Jews. The state of mind of the Arabs, the refusal to share the land with the Jews, and then the call for the annihilation and extermination of the Jewish people, literally to finish what Hitler started. That was the goal of the Arabs. The goal of the Jews was to live at peace. The goal of the Arabs is to exterminate Israel, and that would be the only way they can have peace. There were a series of wars with the Arab states, a few notable wars that I have listed here. Number one, the Six-Day War of 1967. How many of you were around old enough to remember the television reports and the news and all that? What an incredible time that was. I mean, if, if you just go and, and research the Six-Day War, the, the Arab-Israeli Six-Day War, uh, it, it, what an incredible thing. There's a couple of good documentaries out there about it as well. But eight Arab countries, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Algeria, and Kuwait, all were in attack mode to decimate Israel again. But Israel ended up winning that, that war. They had some preemptive strikes. If you read about it, it is quite incredible. There are some uh, hand of God miraculous accounts during that time as well. But Israel acquired some, some lands, and we'll see that here. There's a, the imminent, uh, an image of that. You can see the Sinai Peninsula. Peninsula. Here are some, some things that, you know, a lot of people, we listen to the news, and we hear reporters throw out words like Gaza Strip, West Bank, Sinai Peninsula, all of these things, and we don't really know where they are and what they're talking about. But you can see Israel. The West Bank is actually uh, the east side of Israel. On the, uh, on the west side of Jordan. So that's the West Bank. And then the Gaza Strip is just a tiny little piece. You see Gaza City, and it's attached to the Sinai Peninsula. You see there's a little, a little line right there between the Sinai Peninsula and, and uh, Gaza, the Gaza Strip. That is a very important strategic place for Israel because, as you can see, Egypt can easily funnel all kinds of arms and ammunition through that place. So there have been times that Israel has occupied that place for their own safety. But all of that land right there, over a period of years, Israel gave back in peace treaties all of that land of the Sinai Peninsula in hopes of one thing, peace. Did they get it? No, they did not. So moving ahead, uh, there's a, another war called the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Arab armies took Israel by surprise. They were, you know, a lot of the soldiers were engaged in the Jewish high holiday at that time. 
but the military, Israeli military, the IDF, soon took control, and, and after some heavy losses, they were able to push push back the uh, the Arab enemies that they had there, and were able to uh, to secure the land once again. 1972. How many of you remember the Munich Games in the in the time that the Arabs came in, and what did they do to the Olympic team there? They kidnapped and murdered some of them, and it was a very very difficult and troubling time. And most of the things that I've ever read about this, it was the, the Arabs finding a reason to retaliate against the Jews for something that they had previously done. And, and so, 1981, Israel knocks out Iraq's nuclear capabilities. In 1991, Iraq hits Israel with Scud missiles, and as you know, Operation Desert Storm ensues immediately following that. By 1998, Israel, already just embattled, celebrates 50 years. And uh, what an incredible 50 years of uh, being always on guard, always defending this tiny little piece of land. By the way, if, if you were to look at a map of the size of all of the Arab nations that, that are around Israel, it's some 650 times larger than the little nation of Israel is and yet everybody wants to destroy them. It's a pretty incredible thing. So for 2,000 years, empires like the Babylonians, the Persians, the Medes, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Ottomans have tried to settle that land and make it fruitful, but they could not. Not until the Jews showed up in great numbers in the late 1800s and 1900s, the land literally remained a wasteland. Remember that quote that I had up there from Mark Twain? Mark Twain visited Israel in the 1800s, in the mid-late 1800s, and he talked about how even the cactus and the olive tree, how, how hard it would be for them even to live there. It's such a dry, barren, parched land. And he mentioned that he never even saw a soul while he was there. And so you can get a good idea. The way I picture it, if you can imagine all the great temples and buildings and everything, the architecture that was there, all covered in sand. All of it. And uh, I don't remember what the percentage was, like, like 5% only is what has been unearthed in Israel right now. Maybe a little bit more by now. It is said that the land of Israel responds to the people of Israel. And so when the people of Israel came back into that land, they began to cultivate and nourish the land once again and, and plant and tend and do everything. And today they have turned it from a barren wasteland, literally, to a place that is flourishing where they're exporting uh, many kinds of produce. I mean, it is just, it is a wonderful, beautiful place. If you look at any pictures online, you will see. In Ezekiel 36, 8 and 10, it says this, and you don't have to turn there, but uh, I believe it'll be up here. But you, mountains of Israel, will produce branches and fruit for my people Israel, for they will soon come home. I am concerned for you and will look on you with favor. You will be plowed and sown. And I will cause my people, or many people, to live on you. Yes, all of Israel. The towns will be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. Very quickly, I want to go through four things with you right now. These are historical facts. Two are, two are ancient in nature and two are modern. If you want to write these down, it's great. Again, if you want my notes, email me, Bob at Real Church. I'll shoot these off to you, okay? Number one, with regard to Israel's claim to the land that they now possess. Number one, they had a biblical covenant with Abraham. It included the land promise. Anybody remember that, that little four-letter word that, that I had you say a couple of weeks ago? What, what is it? Olam. Yes, the word olam. What does that mean? It means everlasting. It means forever. There are some out there who will say that, no, that doesn't mean everlasting, it doesn't mean forever. But if it's, if it's you know, something that, that they're saying that, that this land and this covenant would not be forever, this is the same word that is used to refer to God in an everlasting and a forever sense. God is not finite. God is forever. When God makes a promise in the covenant, it will last. Amen? So they had the biblical covenant with, with Abraham, including the land promise, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can read about that in Genesis. In Deuteronomy 4.40, it, it says, For all time, from Cana, Canaan to Judea to Palestine and now Israel. The Jewish people, number two, the Jewish people have developed and maintained a presence in the land 
for 3,500 years. They took possession of the land in 1406 B.C. And even though exiled by the Assyrians and the Babylonians, a remnant has always remained. Like I said, under uh, Roman rule, the land became known as Palestine. But for 19 centuries, there has always been Jewish presence on that land. Number three, modern times. The international community recognized the Jewish claim to the land and granted the Jewish people political sovereignty in Palestine, something that they had been working on for a long time. That came through, again, the Belfort, the Belfort Declaration in 1917 as a result of Jewish persecution and suffering. The UN vote to partition Palestine into Jewish and Arab states, which the, uh, the Arabs rejected. And then the international recognition, after they had become a state, the international recognition that they received from the United States, from Russia, from other countries, immediately started to recognize them as, as a viable state. And then in 1949, they were admitted to the United Nations. So there you had now six million Jews, a distinct nation with historic borders. And then number four, the state of Israel had a right to claim historic lands captured as a result of fighting defensive wars. If we were just to talk just about a, a secular perspective here, just from a wartime perspective, any country would be able to keep the land that they defended or, or defensively fought off the enemy, they would be able to keep the land. And in most countries on the face of the earth for all time, that is what they have done. But not Israel. Israel fought to keep their right to be on the land, but their desire was still to share the land. A pretty incredible place of, of heart there. There's something that I, that, I want to, uh, that I want to close with. I mentioned this two weeks ago. It is something called moral equivalency. Moral equivalency. It's where, in a nutshell, we can take a look at something. Two bullies on the playground are fighting. And uh, they've been fighting for a long time. And, uh, you know, one kid, he's con consistently being picked on and pushed around, pushed around. But then he decides one day to fight back. But that's when everybody takes notice, is the day that he, he fights back. And on the day that he fights back, he starts kicking the, uh, the bully to the curb a little bit, if you know what I'm saying. And so what somebody comes and says, but, but there's no history. This person who comes and looks at this situation, they don't know what has all gone on prior to this, but they see this other kid now rising up against the bully and actually winning the battle. But now that kid is the one who is looked upon as the immoral one. You see what I'm saying? I forgot to use that analogy first service, so you all are blessed. <laughs> but that's what, that's what moral equivalency is. It, it's, it's taking that, that scenario, just what we see, and, and making it something that is equal when in fact it is not and never has been. There's also something called moral relativism. Moral relativism is a philosophy that asserts that there is no global, absolute moral law that applies to all people for all time in all places. That's moral relativism. Summing up the moral relative philosophy, Frederick Nietzsche wrote, You have your way, I have my way. As for the right way, it does not exist. Let me ask you a question. Can we live that way? Truly, can we live that way? A moral code, an absolute moral code must exist and it will work all the time, every day, for all people in every place. It will. But for those who choose to live with no moral code, we will have a battle that is very difficult to fight. I have a lot of stuff to, to read here, but I'm, I'm going to skip over a couple of things. I'm going to read something that I found that, that somebody had written about this, and, and I thought it was, it was good. It's a little bit long. I, I want you just to pay attention to see if you can catch what he's saying here, okay? He says, restricting the freedom of movement of entire communities is immoral. Refraining from these restrictions when there is unequivocal proof 
that this will lead to the murder of innocents is worse. Because movement restricted can later be granted while the dead will never live again. Did you catch that? Demolishing the homes of civilians merely because a family member has committed a crime is immoral. If, however, potential suicide murderers will refrain from killing out of fear that their mothers will become homeless, it would be immoral to leave the Palestinian mothers untouched in their homes while Israeli children die on their school buses. Accidentally killing non-combatants in the crossfire of battles being fought in the middle of cities is immoral. We would all agree with that. Unless refraining from fighting in the Palestinian cities inevitably means the Palestinians will use the safe havens of their cities to plan, prepare, and launch ever more murderous attacks on Jewish non-combatants, these concrete examples and others like them demonstrate that moral considerations the moral considerations that Israel uh, has been dealing with since the Palestinians proudly decided to use suicide murder as their primary weapon. Golda Meir said this in this book, and it's a well-known quote that, that, that she said, but she said this, We can forgive the Arabs for killing our children, but we cannot forgive them for making us kill theirs. Did that sink in? We can forgive the Arabs for killing our children. But we cannot forgive them for making us kill theirs. What I'm trying to demonstrate is the heart of the Jewish people. Now here's the thing. Am I saying that, that I'm trying to make everybody I talk to so pro-Israel that they become totally anti-Arab or Palestinian. Is that my goal? No. Because I believe that we are called to love them both. I think it's important that we understand what is going on there, though, so that we fall on the side of morality and life. We can pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we certainly can pray for the hearts of the Arab people. And I just, I want to just share a couple more things concerning that Arab heart. There's a saying amongst the Arabs regarding a sign on the Day of Judgment. It says, Muslims will fight and kill Jews who hide behind trees that say, O Muslim, O servant of God, here is a Jew hiding behind me. Come here and kill him. The following was broadcast on Palestinian Authority TV, preached at a mosque in Gaza, calling for the killing of Jews and Americans. He said, Have no mercy on the Jews, no matter where they are in any country. Fight them wherever you are. Wherever you meet them, kill them. Wherever you are, kill those Jews and those Americans who are like them. And those who stand by them, they are all in one trench against the Arabs and the Muslims, because they established Israel here in the beating heart of the Arab world in Palestine. The reason why we need to know the history and what is true of that land and what is not, because that area is not the beating heart of the Arab world. If you, uh, I don't have it listed before me here, but it was just in the 1900s that, that many of these countries that are uh, the enemies to Israel even became countries. And all of those people came from other lands. They, they are indigenous, indigenous to another place. And when they say that they are Canaanites or that they are the ancient Philistines, that's not really true either. If you look at genealogies and historical records, the Arab people that are living in Palestine right now, there are no Philistines left. I even read somewhere that there is no DNA even on the face of the earth for a Philistine anymore. And so using any argument that would become the trump card that, that we were there first is, is, not, is not an argument that stands. Israel has been there for 3,500 years in the promises of God. It is God's to give. Amen? And it's not that we say that because we want 
you know, the Arabs to not have a place. We are with the, the Jewish people to say, we can have a place together. We can live together. Let's stop killing our children. The Syrian minister of education wrote in 1968, he said, the hatred which we indoctrinate into the minds of our children from their birth is sacred. In contrast, the Assembly of Palestine Jewry issued an appeal on October 2, 1947. This is before they became a nation. They said this, We will do everything in our power to maintain peace and establish a cooperation gainful to both Jews and Arabs. It is now, here and now, from Jerusalem itself, that a call must go out to the Arab nations to join forces with Jewry and the destined Jewish state and work shoulder to shoulder for our common good, for the peace and progress of sovereign equals. Isn't that something that's, that, that's a little different, isn't it? In Israel's Declaration of Independence, the, the invitation was also addressed, and I, and I had read that, that they would be able to cooperate with the independent Jewish nation for the common good of all. Those Arabs who chose to stay in the land where Israel is now, they in fact get to share as citizens of Israel. They are part of the parliament. They get to help make decisions and elect officials. They are a part of what Israel uh, offered to them in the first place. And so they have kept good their word. There's another example here. In 1981, the PLO violated a July 1981 ceasefire agreement and for 11 months the PLO staged 270 terrorist actions in Israel in the West Bank and in Gaza and elsewhere in Israel and during this time Israel launched a retaliatory raid against PLO bases in Lebanon only to have this thing called moral equivalency come into play where Israel looks like the bad guy because they retaliated because they defended themselves Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger said, no sovereign state can tolerate indefinitely the buildup along its borders a military force dedicated to its destruction and implementing its objectives by periodic shellings and raids. The Hamas Covenant, also known as the Hamas Charter, refers to the Charter of Hamas issued on the 18th of August, 1988, outlining the movement founding identity, their stand and their aims. Listen to this. It says... The Charter identified Hamas as the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine and declares its members to be Muslims who fear and raise the banner of jihad in the face of the oppressors. The Charter states that our struggle against the Jews is very great and very serious and calls for the eventual creation of an Islamic state in Palestine in place of Israel and the Palestinian territories and the obliteration or dissolution of Israel. That is stated in their charter. But to contrast, to go back to the place where I read at the, the Declaration of Israel's Independence, the call was for peace and brotherhood and the sharing. There's a huge difference. The charter also states that Hamas is humanistic and tolerant of other religions as long as they stop disputing the sovereignty of Islam in this region. That's tolerance of other religions. The Charter adds that renouncing any part of Palestine means renouncing part of the religion of Islam. Ahmadinejad quoted a remark from the Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini, the founder of Iran's Islamic Revolution, who said that Israel must be wiped out from the map of the world. Then he said, and God willing, with the force of God behind it, we shall soon experience a world without the United States and Zionism. He is wrong. He is wrong. I have a couple of scriptures that I want to read for you as we close here. And I don't offer these as proof texts or anything. I, I offer them as prophetic readings, if you'll accept them as that. Why Israel is where they are today. Amos chapter 9. You don't have to turn there. You can read these. They'll be on the screen. Amos chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. It says, And I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. 
They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. And we all know about, you know, we talked about the Holocaust and those mountains of bones and, and everything that, that, the trenches of bones and the graves. Ezekiel chapter 37, 10 through 14, it says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you that you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Can a nation be born in a day? Isaiah chapter 66, 6 and 7, or 7 and 8, excuse me. It says, before she goes into labor, she gives birth. Before the pains come upon her, she delivers a son. Who has ever heard of such things? Who has ever seen things like this? Can a country be born in a day, or a nation be brought forth in a moment? Yet no sooner is Zion in labor than she gives birth to her children. Before she goes into labor, she gives birth. Before the pains come upon her, she delivers a son. And I think about May 14th, 1948. The son is born. And then the pain. The battle, the war that would come from the Arab nations that were trying to decimate the land. And then finally, I read this from Luke chapter 13. As Jesus is speaking. Jesus surely, obviously knows all this to come. He stands over Jerusalem and he weeps. And he knows. He knows these days. He's seen them. His people. But yet Jerusalem continues on and on in its ways. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate for 1,900 years. He didn't say that, but that's what. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I can tell you that today in that place, like I've mentioned before, the singers are singing, the dancers are dancing, the preparations are being made for the temple to be built again, and for everything to come into place. I believe with all my heart that Israel is where they are supposed to be today. Psalm 122 says this, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. We need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We need to pray for that ancient land that in our lifetime has come into being once again. Remember I said, and some may poo-poo this and, and have their opinions, but Abraham was born in 1948 and Israel was born again in modern times, 1948. God is a big God. He's got this in control. And I don't doubt that the Lord weeps at both sides. In fact, my wife and I, our family, we sponsor a child in the West Bank. Her name is Jumana All. She is a Palestinian Muslim. But from that area, we are supporting a, an orphan and a widow. And we do it gladly. Pray for her. Give support to her. Hoping to be a Christian witness to her that she might also share that with others. But friends, would you stand? Would you join me as we pray together? Heavenly Father, you know when you have watched over all time 
the journey of your people Israel. You brought them forth from the seed of Abraham until this day. Lord, we ask that, that there would be peace in that land, but we know that there will likely not be peace in that land until Jesus comes again. And so we say, Lord, come quickly. Come quickly to restore the peace and the order of that place. Lord, help our hearts and our minds to be rightly aligned with your heart for Israel and also for the Arab people living in Palestine. Father, may we be lovers of your word, listeners, hearers, doers of your word. But God, may we go forth from this place with Israel on our hearts and on our minds and be praying that truths be told and not lies. We pray for freedom. We pray that their eyes would be open to the Messiah, to Jesus. And Lord, that one day, as a nation, they would say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, Jesus. Amen. Let's, uh, let's close with the song. Charlie, you can...